Okay, thank you very much for everyone who's here um, and listening to this uh, webinar for present applied sciences. My name is Elisa Collado Fregoso. I'm the managing editor of the physics and material science sections of the journal. So uh, today I'm very happy because um, we have an amazing webinar coming up, very interesting, uh, talking about biased agonism in the mu opioid receptor with um, Dr. Karina Martinez Mayorga, uh, Dr. Abraham Madariaga Mason, and um, Mr. Andres Manuel uh, Marmolejo Valencia. So all of them uh, work at the Chemistry Institute of the uh, Autonomous Uni National University of Mexico. And um, well, in the Chemistry Institute and the Chemistry Faculty, right? So they have a medicinal chemistry background and have contributed to the understanding of biased agonism for the discovery of safer analgesics. Uh, other areas of research interest of them include the development of computational models for the prediction of bioactivity and molecular models for binding and recognition. So um, Dr. Karina Martinez Mayorga holds a PhD from UNAM. Uh, after her postdoctoral training at the University of Arizona, she joined the Torrey Pines Institute for Molecular Studies as principal investigator. And since 2012, she has been working at the Chemistry Institute in UNAM. Um, Dr. Abraham Madariaga Mason holds a PhD from UNAM. His PhD dissertation focuses on bioactive natural products. After his postdoctoral training at the uh, Institute of Chemistry UNAM, he joined the same university as research assistant. And Mr. Andres Marmolejo Valencia holds a master's degree from UNAM and he works on GPCR modeling. He is currently pursuing a PhD at the School of Chemistry in UNAM and he's focusing on molecular dynamic simulations for the development of organic solar cells. So welcome to the three of them. This is the first webinar that we have in which we're gonna have uh, three presenters in the same webinar. So I hope it's gonna go well. Thank you uh, to you three for uh, joining us and accepting to, uh, to present your very interesting research. And I hope that uh, um, that everyone is going to be interested and that we're going to have a nice discussion. Um, uh, we will start with Karina. So uh, Karina, the floor is yours and thank you again. Okay, thank you, Alisa, for uh, this opportunity. I'm going to uh, share now my screen and see if it works. Yes, perfect. Excellent. So thank you very much, Alisa, for this opportunity to discuss and show some of the work that we've been doing on this very exciting topic of bias agonism in the mu receptor. So uh, I'm gonna start with a brief introduction of the field, giving some of the background. Then Andres will present some of the details of the paper, uh, the work that we present in the paper in Applied Sciences in, in Springer Nature. And then Abraham will conclude with the, the webinar and give some of the background of other topics that we have been discussing on this field. So let's just start with the top with the protein and uh, system that we we've been exploring. Uh, this molecule or, or the type of molecules that we are interested in are molecules that are um, ligands that bind to G protein couplet receptors. These are very important and very relevant as, uh, proteins, are seven transmembrane helical proteins, and, and they can be activated by uh, many ligands and are involved in different uh, physiological processes, such as vision, uh, with the archetype prot uh, GPCR rhodopsin. They also is invo are involved in smell, taste, pain, and many other uh, processes. The ligands that bind to this receptor vary a lot uh, from uh, photosensitive compounds to odors, pheromones, hormones, neurotransmitters, and many, many others. Uh, some of the drugs that are now in use, the, the list is very large, uh, are listed here in the left. And some of the diseases that are also very relevant are listed here in the right, such as pain, cancer, diabetes, 
uh, S and Z disorders, obesity, inflammation, and uh, other many other diseases. Structurally, these molecules are very important and very relevant and also interesting. Um, one of the features that characterize these proteins is that they are embedded in the membrane and then they, are, they actually need the membrane for functioning. As you can see on this uh, uh, figure here on the right, uh, it's just to show that this, mole this system is flexible. They need this flexibility for the correct functioning of these proteins and they actually communicate the intracellular side and the extracellular side. So these are, this is a characteristic that provides this um, very important functioning of these proteins. Uh, one of the uh, important um, uh, features of this system is that they can activate different mechanisms. In the particular case of um, mu opioid receptor, we can have the bias agonism which means that we can activate selectively different pathways. For example, we can activate the G protein pathway or the beta resting pathway. If we have a molecule that triggers the G protein pathway, we will have uh, the analgesic effect and some uh, adverse effects. And if you, we have, I'm sorry, this is for the arresting. If we have the G protein activated, we will have a large uh, analgesic effect and diminish side effects. This is what has been shown in the literature in different uh, experiments. And uh, structurally, these molecules are not different between them and also are also similar to uh, balanced ligands. The balanced ligands are those that do not have any preferential uh, signaling to the different pathways. So they activate both pathways similarly but structurally they are quite similar. So we cannot distinguish these molecules by looking only to the structures. So we need more information in turn in, um, if we want to design or discover these bias ligands. So what we need to incorporate to discover these molecules and needs to be related with how they bind to the receptor. All this, this discussion is published in this other uh, paper we published in 2017. The uh, different effects that uh, GPCR's agonists have in the receptors are very large and well documented. This list is also in the same uh, reference. And as you can see here is a list of uh, GPCR's where we have, uh, we have observed this bias agonism with these different ligands. We have different pathways that can be triggered and the different therapeutic applications that are involved. So this is a very well-documented effect. And depending on what we want, we can uh, activate one pathway or the other. In the case of myopia receptors, for example, these are some of the molecules that are known to bind selectively to one uh, of the receptors and also to provide this bias agonism. And uh, the idea is to have uh, the analgesic effect with diminished side effects. One of the features that uh, are very important to consider when we are studying this, this phenomenon is the use of different assays. For example, it, we can have these three different uh, assays for knowing uh, the, uh, to which extent the beta resting molecules are um, triggered. So in depending on which a biological assay we use, we, a compound can be biased or unbiased. So it's uh, depending on the assay. So we really need to take attention on which assay we use. So there are molecules or ligands that can trigger, um, the, can have this bias agonism regardless of the assay. So that's why we have some controversy in the literature if a compound will be um, bias agonist or not. So going back to the opioid receptors, so one of the molecules that are really important is salvinorin A. And um, for those that are not familiar with this molecule, this compound was isolated in 1982 by Dr. Alfredo Ortega, 
from this plant called Salvia divinorum, which has a psychoactive effect and is used in folk medicine. So this molecule is very important in the opioid receptor field because it does not have any nitrogen atom on the structure. Before salvironin um, A was discovered, uh, any other molecule that bind to opioid receptor had uh, this nitrogen atom on this structure. And then uh, this molecule was kind of very important and interesting and people didn't believe that it was a binding to opioid receptors. So 10 years later, and Brian Roth reported this uh, work showing that salvironin was a uh, selective kappa opioid receptor agonist. So this was uh, like the proof that this molecule bind to opioid receptors without uh, this nitrogen atom on the structure. So this molecule was then studied further and many analogs were reported. One of the an important analogs is hyrkinorin. So salvironin A, as I said, binds selectively to kappa opioid receptor with 1.9 nanomolar affinity, and is pretty much not binding to the other receptors or very weak. In the case of hyrkinorin, just by changing this benzyl group, we have from a selective kappa opioid receptor binder to a mu, kappa, mu uh, opioid receptor ligand and to some extent to kappa. So this um, small change in the structure shows how we can modify the activity or the affinity in this case, uh, very importantly. Then uh, herkinorin has another important characteristic, uh, which is that it is the first bias agonist known for the mu, mu opioid receptor. So this molecule not only binds to selectively to mu or kappa mu opioid receptor, but also has this bias agonism towards the activation of G protein. So in order to know more about how this um, bias agonism function, uh, we explore different ligands that are shown in this slide. We explore herkinorin, morphine, damgo, and uh, as a negative control, naloxone, which is an antagonist. Herkinorin does not recruit beta resting, even in, if we overexpress this kinase, GRRK2. And it does not internalize the myopia receptor, even when this kinase is overexpressed. In the case of morphine, it recruits beta resting only if we overexpress this this kinase and also internalize the receptor if we overexpress this protein, this kinase. We also have DAMGO, which is a tetrapeptide that binds to the myopia receptor and has the ability to recruit beta resting and internalize more uh, myopia receptor uh, even without uh, the need of overexpressing this kinase. So if you can see that there are different effects for this different molecules. And also we, we explore the antagonist naloxone. So what we uh, will present in, in the next slides with uh, Andres is how we interpret this, uh, how the information is transferred from the extracellular side to the intracellular side. It's basically summarizing these four regions. We have the binding pocket region shown here in blue, there is an important allosteric site uh, shown here in yellow. And then we have some conserved motifs uh, shown in, in brown. And finally, the activation to uh, the intracellular site in the helix eight. And Andres will present uh, in more detail this uh, model. Uh, hi everyone, uh, can you see the, the presentation? Yes. Yes, yes. okay. Um, now, uh, thanks for the invitation. After one great introduction by Karina, uh, I would like to show you how uh, uh, we can model this complex system and talk about some results that we have found to understand the, the bias agonist. 
Summarizing the data in the literature, uh, we have highlighted part of the mu receptor to discuss in blue, and we can find the, the finding pocket. And next, uh, we can find the ye uh, yellow and uh, the allosteric sodium ion site present in, in, the, in one family of the GPCRs. And that's, that is one of the keys to the activation process because the sodium is present in the inactive state and is released to accomplish the activation process. And next in brown, we highlight the two conserved motifs. Um, the first one is close to the allosteric site and the, the other is in a lower position. And they are crucial for the activation because they collapse one hydrophobic barrier present in the inactive state and uh, when the hydrophobic barrier is, is open and the, the water in the channel can flow uh, in, in, through the, in the channel. Uh, finally, we have the helix eight in purple and that is connected with the transmembrane helix seven. Um, um, they, they are involved in the beta resin recruitment. So, um, so um, we will see what's happening here. Next, uh, the methods to, to model this complex system um, uh, uh, are docking methods. They, they use a sampling algorithm, a squaring function. Um, one example, uh, one example is the, uh, we perform flexible alignments for morphine and S structure concerning to ligand to the X-ray crystal in the inactive form. And the scoring function is a overlap function uh, between the ligands. The, here, the protein is, is exclude, excluded. Um, uh, other example is the stochastic cell in, for other ligands like herknorin and dango. And the scoring function is the ICM uh, Ligand binding escort uh, is in the in the package ICM. Uh, here the pocket uh, is needed. The, then the, the protein uh, is is included. Um, molecular dynamic simulation is considered like a docking here or a docking refinement because the propagator of the dynamic the molecular dynamic is is the sampling algorithm. And the force field is the scoring function. Um, one of the advantage of this method is the time evolution. You can see changes in the protein when the um, agonist is present. Um, the, the, the system build uh, can look like this image in, in any part of the system is represented, represented here. Uh, the most important part is the water uh, that came from the one hydration step uh, is crucial because we reach equilibrium faster. Uh, now we will discuss some results that we found in our recent publication. And following the Karina discussion, uh, we build system with these three agonists, herkinorin, morphine, and dango. Here, the dark color represents the arrestine response according to the beta arrestine time location um, from, the, from the cytosol to, to uh, the membrane. Uh, in, however, we notice um, that in the, in the system of morphine and dango, uh, we can find some cavities in, uh, near in the in the allosteric sodium site. Uh, so you, we decide to perform a calculation with sodium and without the sodium. Actually, the, calcula the calculation uh, uh, must be calculated with, without the sodium allosteric because we, we have active states. Um, but uh, we decide to do that. Uh, whoever for herkinorin, we could we could then uh, find the uh, cavities in the allosteric site. So herkinorin just is, is in is performed without the allosteric 
sodium. Okay, here there is a, a video that for, for, for seeing the, the binding mode of morphine and the interaction uh, between agonist and receptor. The first interaction that we can find is the interaction between the histidine uh, to 297 uh, with morphine. Uh, this interaction uh, looks like interaction in the active uh, X-ray crystal uh, that bonds uh, one, one morphine and agonist. The next interaction is the interaction between the lysine 233. Uh, this, is, uh, this residue is important because uh, in the inactive state, the antagonist uh, makes covalent bond with this residue. Uh, next, we have um, the, the connection between three. Uh, amino acids, uh, two tyrosine and one aspartic acid. This aspartic acid is important because all the morphine and structure uh, interacted with, with, with it. Uh, the tyrosine 336 is important because mutation uh, by phenylalanine uh, uh, abrogates the beta arosine uh, recruitment in Dango. Uh, next, we can find the interaction between the, his, the first histidine and uh, the aspartic acid located in the, um, in the allosteric site. Uh, no matter that the sodium is, is present or not, uh, the connection is preserved. And the last interaction that we can find is the interaction between the two aspartic acids. Now, let's see what happened with herkinorin. Uh, we, we find that some interaction are preserved, uh, like, her, like morphine, uh, the interaction with the histidine, the interaction with the lysine, the interaction between the three amino acids, uh, the interaction between the histidine and the aspartic acid. Only the, sh the, the, the form of the interaction is, is changes. Okay, um, in the Dango system, uh, we, we noticed that Dango uh, is too difficult to predict one um, binding mode. Um, because the flexibility of, of Dango. And uh, sometimes Dango goes to, goes to the um, transmembrane helix pipe, like uh, the simulation one. Uh, sometimes goes to the transmembrane helix seven, like the simulation three. And um, uh, the most important thing is the, the, the interaction between the histidine and the aspartic acid in the allosteric site is broken due to the tryptophan 293. Um, next, the system in, uh, when in the sodium present, um, we find that is is a uh, nestable. Um, the simulation two, one part of the simulation two, the dango tried to escape from the binding site. And it's like a, a competition by, by this site, the binding site for this sodium and dango. Uh, this is known in the literature as the agonist sodium effect, where um, the agonist, uh, the binding energy agonist for agonist uh, increase when when the sodium in the environment is increased too. Okay, um, we, we have seen the relevance of water molecules in the nuclear receptor, and then we decide to perform one calculation to, to see the distribution uh, of water molecules in the receptor. 
Um, only for comparison, we perform the, the naloxone. Um, we, we compare, see, if we compare the result, we can see that the system without the allosteric sodium has more water distributed in the intracellular part of the immune receptor. Um, similar to the inactive state naloxone, that means that in our calculation without the sodium allosteric represent the active state. Okay, uh, but what is happening in, in the, this hydrophobic barrier? Uh, we have the two concern motifs, uh, the NPXXY motif, uh, where, where the, this tyrosine 336 is located, and the motif DRAY motif, where the arginine is present. Uh, they start to interact in the active state, and so the collapse the hydrophobic barrier, and then the water is uh, can can go inside the receptor. Uh, to present the next result, we want to see one orientation, and then this video uh, will help us to to see what the orientation we have. Okay, here uh, we can see the, as the allosteric sodium uh, as the aspartic acid uh, mentioned before, uh, the conserved motif uh, where the asparagine uh, and the tyrosine is, is, are located and the visualization of the next figure looks like exactly this. Now, uh, what is in the, in the literature? Uh, we can, uh, in the crystal, for, that, for, for, for mu the mucor receptor in the inactive form, uh, we can see that the tyrosine is connecting the asparagine 86. Uh, when it's activated, um, the tyrosine is now interacting with water molecules that connect with the, um, the asparagine uh, 332. Um, the, the structure in the middle uh, came from the active state bonds one morphine agonist. The last structure, third structure, is, is an active state of, of mu bonds at dango. And here we can see that the tyrosine is now pointing to the cytosol. Um, and now we, we will see what we got. We found that orientation for this concern motif um, 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 represent the experimental data. Uh, for, for instance, the, the first, let me, the first um, confirmation looks like the, the confirmation in the active state with morphine ag agonist. And this confirmation of these two um, system, morphine and, and tango, looks like the confirmation uh, uh, in the in active crystal bounds tango. Um, also, the most important thing here is the population of for this angle uh, is affected by the allosteric sodium ion in the in the active state. And only two populations are present uh, where, where the sodium is present. The, um, the second configuration that we can find here is not reported in the experimental data. So, it, so um, we, we, we can say that is uh, a great result. 
In the, and finally, the system of Herkinorin tried to populate just one conformation, but uh, the sodium allosteric is not present and looks like, uh, like if the allosteric sodium uh, were, were there. Um, and in the end, uh, we, we will talk to, to what's happening if the tyrosine um, is now pointing to the extracellular, intracellular part, to the cytosol. Uh, so uh, this, this tyrosine can be now be phosphorylated and uh, that trigger a uh, non-canonical non signal. And also we mentioned the, the arginine uh, 165 uh, is, is changed now. Um, because this arginine is located in near uh, the intracellular loop too, uh, maybe can uh, uh, affect the interaction with the G protein. And because the tyrosine is located in the end of the, uh, the transmembrane helix seven and the helix eight, uh, maybe change the, the beta regime recruitment in the in the class A family. Now, um, Abraham will give you the, the final part of this presentation. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Andres. Okay, so uh, thank you, Andres. Uh, can we have the, can we see the, the screen, the presentation? Yes. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, thanks again to Elisa for the kind invitation to this webinar. Uh, and now I'm going to, uh, to talk about some of the applications that the myopian receptor signaling uh, researching uh, can be done. So uh, now that we understand how the bias signaling is working, uh, we can use that information for uh, screening new molecules with bias properties that could be useful for the potential development of opiate painkillers. So this is the case of uh, one molecule, oliseridine. Uh, this is the first APA approved more biased molecule, which was approved uh, exactly the last year in August, 2020 by the FDA. Uh, and it was approved for use as intravenous round. This compound or this molecule uh, is an opioid agonist for the management of moderate to severe acute pain in adults. And uh, it, it has the requirement or it is uh, indicated for people that has uh, uh, severe pain and can be, um, the administration can be done only for intravenous uh, routes. So this compound or this molecule, this new drug, uh, has the, the property of being a bias signaling a myopia receptor agonist, and it's used only uh, during inpatient or outpatient procedures. So this is the only molecule uh, currently in the market with this kind of properties. But we have another example, the PCM21, which is a molecule with a potential for uh, drug development. It was discovered in the, using the CADD or the computer-aided drug design. Uh, it was actually uh, discovered from a virtual screening of over 3 million molecules. Uh, these researchers uh, perform a, a screening of the SYNC database compounds, which has more than 3 million molecules. They perform a docking study with all these molecules, with all these database, and they found uh, a few compounds, they chose a few compounds, that uh, seem interesting in the in the docking profile, in the interaction with the protein profile. So they chose a few hundreds of these molecules. They evaluated in, in experimental assays, and they found some compounds that were able to uh, to have this uh, this biological property. After some uh, structural optimizations, they uh, arrived to this molecule which is very different to the known uh, opioid agonist, such as morphine or in the case of uh, oliseridine, which has a very different structure. 
uh, they arrive to this, uh, this molecule, the PCM21. So this is one of the cases where uh, computer-aided drug design uh, has been successful. So uh, this molecule is, is now under uh, preclinical studies, and it also has been studied with uh, another uh, computational uh, methodologies. So we in the, in the research team, we uh, propose a, a strategy following these, uh, these examples uh, to look for new, new molecules that are able to uh, behave as the same as myopia receptor uh, agonists. So we follow a computer aided drug design strategy for looking these uh, more biased ligands. Uh, we started with uh, gathering information uh, we built a molecular database of uh, known biased uh, more ligands, uh, looking for, for molecules in the, in the, in the li literature. And then we followed two different strategies. The first one is the receptor-based strategy, which uh, we use the information of the myopiate receptor, crystal structure, and we perform molecular dockings and molecular dynamics. And the other strategy is um, based on, or well, is a ligand-based strategy, which is based on structural similarity of these known uh, biased ligands. So in the first step in the receptor-based strategy, uh, we calculated a protein ligand interaction fingerprint. And in the second one, in the structure, structural similarity, we uh, studied the structural requirements that ligands or molecules uh, must have to behave as a more uh, biased ligand. With all this information together and put together, uh, we can use them as a filter for the virtual screening and also for uh, the discovery of, the, of potential more biased ligands. And uh, of course, eventually, we can perform the experimental validation of these compounds. So I'm going to talk about uh, how we apply these two strategies in, in, our, in our works. So the first step is uh, the generation of a database. Uh, here we, we uh, selected to or where we built two different databases. The first one is the more bias, which was the uh, use as a reference uh, database. I mean, in this, in this uh, database we have molecules with experimentally known more bias activity. So we gathered 26 molecules in this case. And then we built a second database, which we called a master database that was used for screening. So this database was composed of two different kinds of molecules. The first one is uh, molecules with experimentally known more uh, agonism, I mean with activity that is experimentally known uh, to activate the myopia receptor. Uh, and these molecules come from two different sites, the Cavasoto database, which is public available, and the binding database. The second kind of molecules are the commercial compounds with theoretical myopia receptor agonism. Uh, in this case, we chose two different public, publicly accessible sites the Maybridge uh, database and the Enamine database. These two uh, subsets of compounds in these uh, two large uh, data sets uh, are known or are predicted to be agonists or uh, to have some biological activity on the myopia receptor. Uh, this, uh, this compound is, uh, is uh, in, well, it's important to know that we can buy these compounds. So this, these molecules are publicly available, and we can buy if we can if we can uh, choose or if we choose to to do the experiment assays. So uh, this is a graphical representation of the chemical space of these databases uh, compared to the more biased reference database. So in yellow we can see that the dots uh, color in yellow are uh, the more biased uh, molecules. And in this case, the gray uh, dots are for the enamine database. 
So we can see here in this uh, chemical spray, chemical space and uh, representation that the, that the molecules in the enamine database cover or are in the same area than the more bias in re reference database. We can see the same for the other uh, foreign databases, for example, Maybridge. Uh, this one is Cavasolo. And finally, we have a, sorry, this one was binding database, BDB. And finally, we have Cavasolo. So uh, with this analysis, we can see that uh, all the molecules uh, in the other, in the, in the screening or in the master database uh, cover the area or the chemical space of the references uh, molecules. So now that we have the reference more bias ligands, uh, we can perform a chemical scaffold analysis. In this case, uh, we, um, uh, we, per we performed this uh, analysis and we selected five different groups based on the, on the scaffolds. So we have the analogs of the oliserine molecule, which we call the group A. We have analogs of herkinorine. We have analogs of another molecule, which is a, a natural compound that is called mitragenin. We have a analogs of a molecule that is called SR1718. That is a compound that was discovered, that was proposed by the group of Laura Bond which is a researcher at the Scripps Research Institute. Uh, and it's one of the molecules that is now, uh, that is different to the, to the previous uh, known bias ligands. I mean, the oliseridine and the PCM21. And that has come attention because it have, uh, well, this, this molecule and their analogs uh, have uh, been very, very, very potent at the, at the bias activity. And finally, we have uh, some analogs of the PC, PCM21. So with this information, we follow to the, to the two strategies that I uh, recall previously. So we start with the receptor-based strategy. And for this, we have first to choose the myopia receptor crystal structure for the docking analysis. In this case, uh, we have uh, information in the protein data bank of at least three different conformation of this receptor. The 4DKL is the inactive form of the, of the receptor. The 5C1M is the active form of the receptor. And we have recently uh, the uh, accessive uh, access, sorry, access to the crystal structure of the myopia receptor in the active conformation and also with the G protein uh, coupled to the to the same receptor, so we chose this uh, this uh, this crystal structure, the six six DVE, for the docking analysis. Uh, we performed the, the docking analysis with the biased uh, ligands, and we discover or we uh, we um, see that some of the some of the molecules that has the biased ligands. Uh, have interaction uh, different than that of the molecules that are not uh, biased, for example, the morphine. Uh, nonetheless, the, most of these compounds, uh, the biased ligands and the non-biased ligands, uh, share some common interaction, for example, the aspartate uh, 147, that is crucial for activation of the receptor. So once that we uh, perform the token analysis of the, of the different databases, we can see that the docking score, that is, the, that is a value that we uh, can, on that represents how the compounds uh, are, uh, have affinity for the receptor, or at least theoretically. Uh, we can see that the more biased ligands that are the reference molecules that are in yellow uh, have more or less the same uh, docking scores than the other uh, databases. Nonetheless, for example, enamine has uh, molecules that have better docking scores. The negative, uh, the, the value score, the better. So we have some molecules in the enamine and the Maybridge databases that have uh, better docking scores. So this is very, uh, very interesting. 
So now uh, that we have performed the docking studies on the on the crystal structure of the myopia receptor, we performed the protein ligand interaction fingerprint. This is a representation of the docking results for the Maybridge database. Uh, in the each row of this um, of this uh, plot, each row of this uh, graphic represents a molecule. And in each column is if the interaction with this amino acid, for example, the tyrosine 128 is present or not. So if the molecule has the, the interaction with this uh, amino acid, so then a bit is on. If it's not present, the bit is off. So we can have this kind of representation and we also can have the same information uh, represented in a histogram like this one. So these interaction fingerprints, these protein ligand interaction fingerprints or PLIF, uh, are, are useful for using as a filter uh, when we dock a, a screen database. So for example, we have this database, the enamine, which has uh, 27,000 molecules. And this is the, the protein ligand interaction fingerprint for this database. So we can choose only those molecules that, that, uh, that has the interaction that are uh, representative for biased ligands. And after we perform that, we can see that only 22 molecules uh, has the, the, have the interaction that we want, for example, the aspartate 114 and the threonine 218, for example. So with this kind of, uh, of representation of, or filtering, for, uh, we can choose molecules uh, based on docking interactions that are, uh, that, that are uh, specific or they have a specific interaction profile. So for example, in the Cabasoro database, we have 138 molecules. And after the filtering with the PLIF uh, profile, we only have one molecule that accomplished with uh, the whole uh, interaction profiles. So after filtering this, uh, all the, the databases, we only have uh, from the 64,000 molecules that we have at the beginning, uh, we only have 29, 28, uh, sorry, 19, uh, almost 100 molecules with this interaction profile. So this is the top 10 molecules. <clears throat> Sorry, this is the top 10 molecules and the interactions uh, uh, profiles. And as, as we can see in this representation, we can see that most of the molecules uh, have the interactions that we, uh, that we want that they have the threonine 218 and the leucine 219, and also uh, have the aspartate 147 that is essential for the, for the activation of the receptor. So this is the top 10 uh, selected molecules. We can see that most of them are different among them. And we can see uh, in, the, in the representation, that we have only molecules from enamine and Maybridge databases, which is very interesting because we, uh, as we can uh, saw in the in the docking score uh, plots, these two uh, databases have the better have the better uh, docking score values. So this is our, our proposal for uh, molecules be, uh, with following a receptor-based strategy. Next, and for and, or finally, uh, we follow a ligand-based selection strategy. This is, uh, we have an accurate database, which, are, which is the, the one that we have now. We have information of molecules with known activity. And we use only uh, have to perform a similarity analysis between these molecules, the curated uh, databases, and the references uh, databases. So we perform that with a Tanemoto coefficient that uh, has information of uh, both molecules that are uh, in comparison, structural uh, motifs of <clears throat> or functional groups. 
And uh, the score of Tanimoto just tell us how similar are these compounds. For example, we have this one, uh, and we have these three ones uh, that have um, more or less similar uh, coefficients. So we perform this uh, similarity uh, 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 strategy with a program with its name, which is based on workflows. Here we have the two databases, the references da database and the screen database. We have to calculate the fingerprints for, mo for both uh, sets of molecules. We have to perform the fingerprint similarity uh, calculation which is this one, uh, we have the Tanimoto score. And then we filter these compounds for choosing only those compounds that accomplish, for example, uh, more than 70% of identity. So finally, we can concat con concatenate those uh, results and we can have this kind of, of uh, results. In this case, we uh, selected uh, more or less uh, 70 molecules. And we can see here that we have a group of five molecules that are very similar among them, and some other molecules that has uh, nothing to see with, this, with these molecules. So uh, with these two strategies, we uh, selected uh, approximately uh, 100 molecules with a potential to be uh, more biased uh, agonist. So in summary, uh, well, uh, bias agonism or functional selectivity, as, as well known in GPCRs, represents an opportunity for designing new drugs with better pharmacological profiles. And in the very specific case of the myopia receptor bias uh, agonism, there are molecules that has been uh, presented as new drugs with, uh, with better uh, pharmacological profiles. This is the case of oliseridine. And well, of the, from the results of, of Andres uh, presented, uh, we have that the modulation of the allosteric sodium side in the opioid receptor appears essential for the regulation of movement, movements in intracellular loops and also the transmembrane helices. And because this agonist or uh, the sodium ion affects the vicinity of this allosteric site, uh, this can be renamed as a bias inducing allosteric binding site. So with this in mind, we have to acknowledge all the uh, collaborators, so the students, and all the institutions involved in this, in this work. And thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Abraham, Andres, and uh, Karina. It was a very nice presentation, very interesting. I am wondering if anyone has any question. I don't think I have anything on the on the chat box. So uh, I'm gonna start uh, with a few quick questions for you, because I, I thought that uh, you presented a little bit about the effect of uh, sodium ion uh, in the the allosteric effect of sodium ion. I am wondering if is this was sodium is uh, especially picked like if if you pick a different ion for example potassium do you do you expect to have a different result or why can you maybe comment more on why uh, sodium was picked or is it like an uh, to, to simulate uh, the effect of ionic strength or uh, or maybe you can comment more you know much more than me about it. Uh, usually uh, the sodium is in more concentration in the extracellular part, then they try to get into the cell. And so it's difficult to, to have a, the potassium action here. But also the channel maybe is, is have one, and um, uh, white to to the sodium ion, not for uh, the potassium ion. Does okay, so so it's trying to kind of simulate more uh, natural uh, environment, let's say. So that's what you would normally have in a in the, in the cell, let's say. Yes. Yes. This is. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't think I see any any question at the moment. Uh, I th I found very interesting what uh, what Abraham was mentioning at the end about uh, about this uh, this compound that is already in uh, in the market. So I I actually thought that I don't think I heard an, any comment uh, on your presentation about uh, addiction, right? Because all of these um, uh, these painkillers, uh, strong, especially morphine based, but others as well, can cause uh, um, addiction. Is there is is it is it something that you can uh, simulate or that you can see what exactly at the molecular level is uh, that is is addiction? Yeah, well, I can comment on that, Elisa, uh, or and Abraham can also develop on that. Yeah, so it is not like trivial to simulate that type of the effects. However, the, how the molecule is able to internalize the receptor is related to the effects that it will have. So that's why we, you, you measure the internalization capabilities of these molecules. And in just in general, what we mentioned about this different um, signaling, either a G protein or beta resting pathway is the way that uh, can be uh, indirectly see uh, how it's gonna be affected. So in general, you want to trigger for mu opioid receptor, the G protein pathway instead of the beta resting pathway in order to diminish the overall uh, side effects, including tolerance, uh, addiction, and things like that. I don't know if, if everyone wants to develop more on that. Um, no, it's, it's just the same that uh, the case of the myopia receptors with, uh, with a bias of the G protein instead of the beta arrestins, uh, we can avoid the side effects, but specifically, specifically the, uh, the respiratory side effects and the gastrointestinal side effects. In the case of addiction and other uh, neurological disorders, it's more complex than only one of the one of the signalings on the, on the GPCR that are activated. So in this case, we are, uh, well, uh, these kind of molecules avoid only the physiological side, side effects, or this is the case of the oliserated molecule. Okay, very yeah. interesting. So there's more research to do, let's say, on that, uh, on the more uh, psychotropic, let's say, effects. Yes, of course, and I'm not sure if that kind of, uh, of uh, information can be gathered from computational analysis. Maybe this kind of effects of, physio of uh, neurological effects uh, have to be done with uh, experimental sense, I think. Okay, okay. Thank you for, for the Thank comment. This is, this is very interesting. And uh, maybe just one final question, because this is uh, very interesting. But I'm wondering whether uh, the narrowing that you did in, in your study, uh, there's, uh, what, what's the future on that? You're planning to uh, maybe narrow it a bit more and then uh, try to do, uh, collaborate with uh, experimental groups to try to uh, come up with whether uh, one of these molecules can actually be used as a painkiller. Yeah, of course, uh, that's the hope of this uh, of these results. I mean, we only propose uh, this hundred, this bunch of hundred of molecules with a uh, potential to be biased on the myopic receptor, and we have to validate it uh, with experimental assays. So we have a couple of uh, collaborators in Florida. I think maybe Karina can <laughs> can assure that, but in in Florida, and of course, we are open to collaborate with anyone else who, who can perform these kind of things. Yeah, we work, we still work with the group that we know in Torrey Pines and for the International Florida University and also another group in North Carolina that work, work on these assays. It's not trivial because the system is not, is not um, easy to work with. And also, for example, if you wanna do some experiments that involve these psychotropic molecules such as morphine and things like that, you need to have to be very careful and everything is very controlled. So it's not that simple, but it's very interesting and very useful. You know? 
Yeah, exactly. Special permits, I'm, I'm assuming, right? And then I guess you can need to see which uh, um, uh, animal models you need as well. And uh, yeah. Right, that's, that's very true. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for your very nice and very interesting presentation. I think I'm, I'm going to start uh, stop the questions there because we're already a little bit uh, after the, the time. I don't see any questions from the public, unfortunately, but uh, I am hoping that uh, if people are maybe a bit shy, please drop an email to, uh, to Karina, to Abraham or Andres or myself if you have any questions about the paper itself or about the journal. And thank you so much for joining uh, the, the webinar. Thank you uh, to, uh, to, to the three of you, Karina, Abraham and Andres, because uh, it was very nice to have you here. And thank you also for submitting your paper. It was, uh, uh, I think, a very nice experience for all of us. And uh, I hope that uh, you're going to be uh, lucky with your compounds and that you, uh, hopefully one of them is going to be uh, the next uh, uh, famous painkiller. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the invitation and all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. Thank you.